took place at 24 Culver Street, Paddington. The murdered woman was a Mrs. Maureen Lyon. In connection with the murder, the police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity wearing a dark overcoat, light scarf, and soft felt hat. Burglars are warned against icebound roads. The heavy snow is expected to continue, and throughout the country there will be a certain freezing, particularly at points on the north and northeast coast of Scotland.
weather is simply awful. My tax gave up your day. What an attempt to drive. No sporting instinct. Are you Miss Ralston? How delightful. My name's Ren. How do you do, Mr. Ren? You know, you're not as all as I pictured you. I've been thinking of you as a retired general's widow. Indian Army. I thought you'd be terrifically grim and messy keepish, and that the whole place would be simply grim for Bernard's brass. Instead, it's heavenly, quite heavenly. Lovely proportions. Oh, that's a thing. Oh, if this table's genuine, I'm simply going to love it here. Do you have any wax flowers or birds of paradise? I'm afraid not. What about a sideboard, a purple, plummy, mahogany sideboard with great solid curve? <laughs> yes, we have, in the dining room. In here, I must. Respectability. But why put away with the center mahogany table? Little tables just spoil the effect. We thought that guests would prefer them. Oh, this is my husband. How do you do? Terrible weather, isn't it? Takes one back to the Dickinson Scrooge and that irritating tiny Tim. Oh, so bogus. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Miss Ralston, you were right about the little tables. I was being carried away by my feeling for period. If you had a mahogany dining table, you'd have to have the right family around it. A stern, handsome father with a beard, prolific, faded mother, eleven children of assorted ages, a grim governess, and someone called poor Harriet, the poor relation who acts as a general's dog's body, but is very, very grateful for being given a good home. I'll take this upstairs for you. Oak room, did you say? Yes. I hope it has a four-poster with little chintz roses. It hasn't. <laughs> I don't believe your husband is going to like me very much. How long have you been married? Are you very much in love? We've been married just a year. Perhaps you'd like to go into your room. <sighs> Ticked off. But I do like knowing all about people. I think people are mad interesting, don't you? Well, I suppose some are and some are not. No, I don't agree. I think everyone is interesting. Because you never really know what someone is like, or what they're thinking. <laughs> For instance, you don't know what I'm thinking about now, do you? Not in the least. Cigarette? No thanks. You see, the only people who really know what others are like are artists. Are artists. They don't know why, but they know it. And if they're portrait painters, wow, well, it comes out on the canvas. Are you a painter? No, I'm an architect. My parents, you know, baptized me Christopher in the hope that I'd be an architect. Christopher Wren! As good as a halfway home. Of course, everyone laughs and makes jokes about St. Paul's, but who knows? I may yet have the last laugh. Chris Wren's prefab nest may yet go down in history! <laughs> I'm going to like you here. I find your wife most sympathetic. Indeed. And really, very beautiful. Don't be absurd. Isn't that like an English woman? Compliments always embarrass them. European women take compliments as a matter of course, but you English women have all the feminine spirit pushed up in by their husband. <laughs> <laughs> There's something very boring about English husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you'd like some tea room. Shall I? Drive might at least have been clear to 
No. Most offhand and casual, I must say. I am so sorry. I, Mrs. Ralston. Yes, I. You're very young. Young? To be running an establishment of this kind? You can't have had much experience. There has to be a beginning for everything, hasn't there? I see quite an experience. An old house. Hope you haven't got dry rot. Certainly not. Lots of people don't realize they have dry rot until it's too late to do anything about it. The house is in perfect condition. <laughs> Could do with a coat of paint. You know you've got worm in this oak. This way, Major. This is my wife. How do you do? Absolute blizzard outside. I nearly thought we shouldn't have made it. If it keeps going like this, we'll have five or six feet of snow by morning. I haven't seen anything like it since my leave in, what was it, 1940? I'll take these up. Which room did you say? We were in the Rose Room. Uh, no, I, I put Mr. Red in the Rose Room. He liked the four poster so much. So it's Major Metcalf in the Blue Room and Mrs. Boyle in the Oak Room. Major. Sir. that we should be able to fill your place quite easily. At any rate, we are raising our terms next month. I am certainly not going to leave before I've tried what this place is like. You needn't think of turning me out now. Perhaps you'll see me to my room, Mrs. Rolls. <coughs> certainly, Mrs. Boyle. <coughs> Darling, you were wonderful. I think that's a perfectly horrible woman. I don't like her at all. I'd like to see you send her to the snow. Serve her away. Oh Lord, there's another one. Come in, come in. Bring my car bogged about half a mile down the road. I need to drift. Let me take this. Anything else in the car? No, I travel light. Ah, what? You get a nice slide. Er, Mr. Wren, Miss... Casewell. Might be down in a minute. No hurry. Gotta get myself thought out. Looks as though you're gonna be snowed up here. Weather forecast says, heavy falls expected, motors worn. Hope you've got plenty of provisions in. Oh yes, my wife is an excellent manager. In any case, we can always get our hands. Before we start on each other, eh? Any news in the paper? Apart from the weather. Usual political crisis. Oh, and a rather juicy oh. murder. Murder? Oh, I like murder. Yeah, it seems that was a homicidal maniac. String of a woman near Paddington. So maniac, I suppose. <sighs> Doesn't say much, does it? The police are anxious to interview a man seen in the vicinity of Culver Street at the time. 
wearing a darkish overcoat, lightish scarf, and a soft felt hat. Police messages to this effect have been broadcast throughout the day. Useful description. Fit pretty well anyone, wouldn't it? When it says the police are anxious to interview someone, is that a polite way of hinting that he's the murderer? <laughs> Could be. Who's the who's murdered? Um, Mrs. Lyon. Mrs. Maureen Lyon. Younger <coughs> old. Doesn't say. It doesn't seem to have been a robbery. I told you, some maniac. This is my wife, Molly. Here's Miss Case Law. How do you do? It's an awful night. Would you like to come up to your room? The water's hot. You'd like that? You're right, I would. Give it a real continental flavor. Show me where the kitchen is and what you've got, and dare I say, I might have an inspiration. Come on. <laughs> Now as for me, 
I have all I need here in this little bag. Yes. All that I need. You'd better get thoroughly warm. I'll see about your room. It's a rather cold room, I'm afraid, because it faces north, but all the others are occupied. You have several guests, then? There's Mr. Metcalf and Mrs. Boyle, Miss Casewell, and a young man called Christopher Wren. And now you. Yes, the unexpected guest. The guest you did not invite. The guest who just arrived from nowhere out of the store. It sounds quite dramatic, does it not? Who am I? You do not know. Where do I come from? You do not know. <laughs> Me? I'm the man of mystery. <laughs> but now, I tell you this. I complete the picture. From now on, there will be no more arrivals. And no departures either. By tomorrow, perhaps even already, we are cut off from civilization. No butcher, no baker, no milkman, no postman, no daily papers. No one and nothing but ourselves. That is admirable. Admirable. My name, by the way, is Perrachi. Oh, yes. <laughs> Ours is Ralston. Mr. and Mrs. Ralston. And this is Monkswell Manor Guesthouse, you said? Good. Monkswell Manor Guesthouse. <laughs> Oh, I consider it most dishonest not to have told me they were only just starting this place. Well, everything's done from the beginning, I suppose. Excellent breakfast this morning. Coffee, scrambled egg, and homemade marmalade, too. Little woman does it all herself. Amateurs. There should be a proper staff. Excellent lunch, too. Corn beef. But very well disguised corned beef with red wine in it. And Miss Rawson said she was going to make us a pie tonight. From the advert, these radiators are not very hot. I shall speak about it. Very comfortable beds, too. At least mine was. I hope yours was, too. It was quite adequate. I just don't see why the best budget should have given, been given to that very peculiar young man. Got here ahead of us, I suppose. First come, first serve. From the advertising, and I, I got what a different impression of what this place would be like. A comfortable riding room, a much larger place altogether, with bridge and other amenities. A regular old cubby's boy. I beg your pardon. Oh, yes, I quite see you. No, indeed. I shan't stay here long. <laughs> no, no. I don't suppose you will. <laughs> <laughs> what a peculiar young man. Unbalanced mentally, I shouldn't wonder. I think he escaped from a lunatic asylum. I shouldn't be at all surprised. Giles? Yes? Can you shovel the snow away again from the back door? Coming. I'll help you. Good exercise. God has good exercise. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's all right. Really, what an incredible young woman. Doesn't she know anything about housework? Carrying a carpet feeder through the front hall? Aren't there any back stairs? Oh yes, nice back stairs. Very convenient if there was a fire. Then why not use them? Anyway, all of the housework should have been done in the morning before lunch. I gather our hostess had to cook the lunch. All very haphazard and amateurish. There should be be a proper staff. Not very easy to get nowadays, is it? No, indeed. The lower class does seem to have no idea of their responsibilities. Poor old lower class. Got the bit between their teeth, haven't they? I gather you're a socialist. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I'm not a red, just a pale pink. But 
I don't take much interest in politics. I live abroad. I suppose conditions are much easier abroad. I don't have to cook or clean, as I gather most people have to do in this country. This country has gone sadly downhill, not what it used to be. I sold my house last year. Everything was too difficult. Hotels and guest houses are much easier. They certainly solve some of one's problems. Are you over in England for long? Depends. I have some business to see to. When it is done, I shall go back. To France? No. Italy? No. Would you mind not having that on quite so loud? I always find the radio rather distracting when one is trying to write letters. Do you? If you don't particularly want to listen just now. Oh, but it's my favorite music. There's a the right people in there. I know, but it's much warmer in here. Much warmer. I agree. <laughs> How's that? Oh well, yes, it served its purpose. <laughs> <laughs> what purpose? Tactics, boy. Oh, you mean her? She pitched the best chair. I've got it now. <laughs> you drove her out. I'm glad, very glad. I don't like her one bit. Let's think of things we can do to annoy her, shall we? I wish you would go away from here. In this, not a hope. Oh, but when the snow melts. Snow melts? Lots of things may have happened. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. Snow is rather lovely, isn't it? So peaceful and pure. Makes one forget things. It doesn't make me forget. How fierce you sound. I was thinking. What sort of thinking? I saw a bedroom jug. Chill blames. Raw and bleeding, one thin rag blanket, child shivering with cold and fear. My dear, that's too, too grim. What is it? A novel? Didn't know I was a writer, did you? Are you? Sorry to disappoint you. Actually, I am not. Yes, this is Monsal Manor Guest House. What? Uh, no, I'm afraid Mr. Ralston can't come to the telephone just now. This is Mrs. Ralston speaking. Who? The Berkshire Police. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Hogman. I'm, uh, I'm afraid that's impossible. We're snowed up, completely snowed up. Nothing can get through. <laughs> but the roads are impassable. Yes? Very well. But what about, hello? Hello? Molly, do you know there's another spade? Giles, the police have strung up. Trouble with the police, eh? Serving liquor without a license? <laughs> <laughs> They're sending out an inspector or a sergeant or something. But he'll never get here. Th What's it all about? That's what I asked, but he didn't say. He just said I was to impress on my husband to listen very carefully to what Sergeant Trotter, I think it was, had to say. It follows instructions implicitly. Isn't that extraordinary? What on earth do you think we've done? Do you think it's those nylons from Gibraltar? I did remember to get the wireless license, didn't I? Yes, it's in the kitchen dresser. I had a weather in your shape with the car the other day, but it wasn't entirely the other fellow's fault. We must have done something. I reckon it's something to do with running this place. We've likely ignored some tin pot regulation or some ministry or other. You probably can't avoid it nowadays. And here, we never started this place. We're gonna be snowed up for days and everyone is cross and we should go through all our reserves of tin. Cheer up, darling. It's all been all right so far. I've done the wood, I've done the hens, I've filled up the coal scuttles and I've stoked the aga. Next, I'll do the boiler and I'll chop some kindling. Molly, 
Um, oh gosh. You must do something pretty serious, though, to send police sergeant check me out and all of this. Something rather urgent. Ah, Mr. Ralston. Did you know that the central heating in the library is practically stone cold? I'm sorry, Mrs. Well, we're running a bit short on coke at the moment, you see, and... I am paying seven guineas a week here. Seven guineas. And I do not want to freeze. I'll go and soak it up. Mrs. Rawson, if you don't mind my saying so, that is a very extraordinary young man you have stayed here. His manners, his ties, and... Does he ever brush his hair? He's an extremely brilliant young architect. I beg your pardon. Christopher Wren is an architect. My dear young woman, I have naturally heard of Sir Christopher Wren. Of course he's an architect. He built St. Paul's. You young people seem to think that no one is educated but yourselves. I meant this, Wren. His parents called him Christopher in the hopes that he'd be an architect, and he is, or nearly one, so it turned out all right. Huh. Sounds a fishy story to me. I'd make some inquiries about him if I were you. What do you know of him? Just as much as I know about you, Mrs. Boyle, which is that you're both paying us seven guineas a week. That is all I really need to know, isn't it? And all that concerns me. It doesn't matter to me whether I like my guests, or whether I don't. You are young and inexperienced, and should welcome advice from someone more knowledgeable than yourself. And what of this foreigner? What about him? You weren't expecting him, were you? To turn away a bona fide traveler is against the law, Mrs. Boyle. You should know that. Why do you say that? Weren't you a magistrate sitting on the bench, Mrs. Boyle? All I say is that this Mr. Perbaccini, or whatever he calls himself, Seems to me. Beware, lady! You talking to the devil? And here he is. I didn't hear you come in. I came in on tiptoe, like this. <laughs> Nobody ever hears me. If I do not want them to, I find that very amusing. Indeed. Now, there was a young lady. I must get on with my letters. I'll see if it's much warmer in the drawing room. My charming hostess looks upset. What is it, dear lady? Everything's rather difficult this morning because of the snow. Yes, snow makes things difficult, does it not? <laughs> or else it makes them easy. Yes, very easy. I don't know what you mean. No, there is quite a lot you do not know. I think, for one thing, you do not know very much about running a guest house. <laughs> I dare say we don't, but we need to make a go of it. Bravo! Bravo! I'm not such a very bad cook. You're without doubt an enchanting cook. May I offer you a little word of warning, Mrs. Ralston? You and your husband must not be too trusting, you know. Have you references with these guests of yours? Is that usual? I always thought we just Came? It is advisable to know a little about the people who sleep under your roof. Take, for example, myself. I turn up saying my car has overturned in a snowdrift. What do you know of me? <laughs> Nothing at all! I may be a thief, a robber, a fugitive from justice, a madman, even a murderer. Oh. You see, and perhaps you know just as little of your other guests. Well, as far as Mrs. Boyle goes, the drawing room is far too cold. I shall write my letters in here. Allow me to poke the fire for you. Ah, Miss Ralston, is your husband about? I'm afraid the pipes and the downstairs cloak are frozen. Oh dear, what an awful day. First the police, and the police? Police, did you say? They rang up. Now, say so there's sending a sergeant out here, but I don't think he'll ever get here. Great coke more than half stones in the prep. Hello, is something the matter? I hear the police are on their way here. Why? Oh, that's quite alright. They'll never get here. The snow out there must be five or six feet deep now, and the roads are all baked up. Yes, no one will get here today. Excuse me, Mr. Burrucini, can I put these down?
Are you Mr. Ralston? Yes. I can start the Trotter of the Berkshire Police. Can you take off my skis and uh, still do the work? I'll meet you. I suppose that's what we pay our police force for nowadays. To go around enjoying themselves in winter sports. Why did you send for the police, Mrs. Ralston? But I didn't. Who is that man? Where did he come from? He passed by the drawing room window on skis, all covered in snow, but looking terribly hardy. You may believe it or not, but that man was a policeman. A policeman skiing. This is Detective Sergeant Trotter. Good afternoon. You can't be a sergeant. You're too young. I'm not quite as young as I look now. Mm, but terribly hard. Miss <laughs> 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 Rolson, could I use your telephone? Of course, Major Metcalf. Yeah. He's very attractive, don't you think so? I always thought policemen were attractive. <laughs> <laughs> no brains. You can see that at a glance. Hello? 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 Miss Rolson, the telephone is dead, quite dead. It was all right about half an hour ago. It could have gone with the way there's the snow. <laughs> so we're cut off, quite cut off. That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> I don't seem to be the lot that. Oh. No, indeed. It's a private joke of my own. I wonder where the sleuth is. Uh, OK, let's get down to business, Mr. Ralston. Uh, Mrs. Ralston? If you'd like to talk to us in private, we can go to the library. It's far more secluded. No, that, that won't be necessary. It'll save time if uh, we're all present here. Would you hurry up and tell us? What have we done? Oh, done? It's, it's nothing of that kind, Mrs. Ralston. It's more a matter of, what you call it, police protection. You understand that? Police protection? Yep. It leads to the death of Mrs. Lyon. Mrs. Marine Lyon of 24 Calder Street, London, West 2, who was murdered yesterday, the 15th instance. You, uh, May have heard or heard about the case? Never heard of her. I heard it on the wireless, the woman who was strangled. That's right. Now what I want to know from you is that you're acquainted with her, and as you say, you don't have any connection with her, correct? That's correct. Okay, well, you may have known her the name Lion. You see, Lion wasn't her real name, so get a piece of record, or there's one file. He had no difficulty identifying her. Her real name was Maureen Stanning. Her husband was a farmer, John Stanning, who was at Long Ridge Farm, not very far from here. Longridge Farm. Isn't that where those children? Yes, the Longridge Farm case. Three children. That's right, Miss. The Corgans. Two boys and a girl. Brought before the court as a need of care and protection. A home was found for them with Mr. and Mrs. Stanley at Longridge Farm. One of the children subsequently died as a result of criminal neglect and persistent ill treatment. The case made a bit of sensation at the time. It was horrible. Well, the Stannings were sentenced to terms of imprisonment. Stanning died in prison. Mrs. Stanning served her sentence and was duly released. Yesterday, as I say, she was found strangled at 24 Culver Street. I'm well, coming to that, madam. A notebook was picked up near the scene of the crime. In that notebook was two addresses. One was 24 Culver Street. The other was Monksville Man. What? <laughs> That's why Superintendent Pogdett, on receiving this information from Scotland Yard, thought it apparent for me to come down and find out if there's any connection between this house anyone in this house and the Long Ridge Farm case. There's no connection. It must be nothing. Some kind of coincidence. No, no. You see, Superintendent Hogman doesn't think it's a coincidence, sir. He'd come down here himself if in any way possible, you know, under the weather conditions, and as I can ski, he sent me down to get full particulars of everyone in the house, report to them back by phone, and to take what measures I see fit to ensure the safety of this household. Safety? What dangers do you think we're in? Surely he doesn't expect that someone's going to be killed here. Well, I don't want to frighten any of the ladies, but frankly, yeah. But why? Well, that's what I'm here to find out. But the whole thing's crazy. Yes, it's because it's crazy that it's dangerous. Nonsense. I must say, it seems a bit far-fetched. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something that you haven't told us, Sergeant? Yes. A notebook was picked up near the scene of the crime, as I already mentioned before. However, under the words of the notebook was a drawing of three little mice. And on the dead woman's body was a note posted with, this is the first, written on it. Under those words was a bar of music, and the music was to the tune of three blind mice. You know how it goes. Three blind mice, three, three blind mice. mice. See how they run. They all ran after the farm, that's why they took off on a car and went. Oh, it's horrible. 
There were three children and one died. Yes, uh, the boy, the youngest, eleven. And the other two. What's become of them? Well, the girl, she was adopted shortly after, and we don't know her present whereabouts. The elder boy would be about 22, deserted from the army and has not been heard of since. According to the army psychologist, a bit queer in the head, that's the same. And you think that it was he who killed Mrs. Lyon, Mrs. Stanley? Yes. And that he's a homicidal maniac that would turn up here? But why? Well, that's what i got to find out from you. The way the superintendent sees that there must be some sort of connection. Now, you yourself, sir, state you have no connection with Longridge Farm case? No. Same goes with you, madam. I, no, I, no connection. I see. Uh, what about servants? We haven't gotten servants. That reminds me, Sergeant Trotter. Would you mind if I went to the kitchen? I'll be in there for a Certainly, Mrs. Walton. Okay. May I have all your names, please? This is quite ridiculous. We are merely staying in this kind of hotel. We only arrived yesterday. We've nothing to do with this place. Yeah, well, guess what? We plan to stay here ahead of time. You all booked your rooms here ahead. Well, yes. All except Mr. How did you? My car overturned in the snowdrift. I see. What I'm getting at is anyone who's been following you around knows very well that you are coming. Now, there's one thing I want to know, and I want to know it quickly. Which one of you has some connection with the Long Ridge Farm business? Not being very sensible, you know. One of you is in danger. i got to find out who that is. All right, have it your way. I'll ask you one by one. Uh, you, since you arrived here more or less by accident, just to prepare me. Para! the chief! But, my dear inspector, I know nothing, fuck nothing, of what you are talking about. I'm a stranger in this country. I know nothing of these local affairs bygone years. Okay, uh, Mrs. Boyle. I don't see, really, I consider it an impertinence. Why on earth should I have anything to do with such this distressing business? Okie dokie, Miss. Casewell. Leslie Casewell. I have heard of Long Ridge Farm and know nothing of it. You, sir. Metcalf, Major. I'll station, uh, I read about the case, case, case in the papers on the time. I'll station in Edinburgh then, no personal knowledge. And you? Oh. Christopher Wren, I was a mere child at the time. Don't even remember hearing about it. <laughs> and that's all I got to say. Any of you? Well, one of you gets, you know, murdered. Well, it's all you have for only yourselves to blame. Uh, now then, uh, Mr. Ralston, may I have a tour around the house, please? Thank you. Oh, my dears, how melodramatic. He's very attractive, isn't he? I always did admire policemen. So stern and hard boy. Quite a thrill, this whole business. Three blind mice. How does the tune go? Really, Mr. Red? Oh, you don't like it? But it's a signature tune, the signature of a murderer. Just fancy what a kick he must be getting out of all of it. Melodramatic rubbish. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, but just you wait, Miss Boyle. I'll creep up behind you when you feel my hands around your throat. No! Quite well, enough, Christopher. It's a poor joke. In fact, it's not a joke at all. Oh, but it is. That's just what it is. A madman's joke. That's what makes it so deliciously macabre. If you could just see your faces. <laughs> a singularly ill-mannered and neurotic young man. Where's Giles? Taking our policeman on a conductor tour of the house. Your friend, the architect, has been behaving in the most abnormal manner. Young fellow seems nervous nowadays. Dare say he'll grow out of it. Nerves? I haven't any patience for anyone who says they have nerves. I haven't any nerves. No, I don't suppose you would, Miss Boyle. What do you mean? I think you were one of the magistrates on the bench at the time. In fact, you were the one who sent those children to Longridge Farm. Really, Mr. Red, yeah. Mr. Metcalf, I, I could hardly be held responsible. The farm people seemed very nice and were most anxious to have the children. The, it seemed most satisfactory. Eggs, fresh milk, and a healthy out-of-doors life. Kicks, blow, starvation, and a thoroughly vicious couple? But how was I to know? They were very civilly spoken. Yes, I was right. It was you. One tries to do public duty, and all one gets is abuse. 
Oh, you must forgive me, but indeed I find all this most amusing. I enjoy myself greatly. <laughs> I never did like that man. Where did he come from last night? I don't know. Looks a bit spiff to me. Makes up his face too. Rouge and powder. Disgusting. Looks quite old too. And yet he skips about as though he were a much younger man. You'll be much more wood. I'll get it. It's already dark and it's only four in the afternoon. I'll turn the lights on. Where did I leave my pen? It's, it's the wire that worries me, and it's, it's 
It's been cut. I, I must go and get on food and dinner. Is there an extension? Excuse me. What yes, Mr. Ask? Yeah, Mr. Ralston, I did. I, I said, is there an extension? Um, yes, of course. Up in our bedroom. Can you go upstairs and try for me? Of course. Thank you. understand what I may term as the mechanics of fear, you have to study the precise effect produced on the human mind. Imagine, for instance, that you are alone in a room. It is late in the afternoon. A door opens softly behind you. Where were you when Mrs. Walson screamed? I was still in the, in the room. 
You see, the extension telephone is dead. So I looked out the window, and the line was cut there. I couldn't find any, the line wasn't cut there. I couldn't find anywhere it was cut. And then I went on, and as soon as I closed the window, I heard my scream, and I rushed out. Those simple actions took you a rather long time, didn't they, Mr. Ralston? I don't think so. I say you definitely took your time on that. I was thinking about something. I see. Mr. Randall, I'll count where you were. I've been in the kitchen seeing if there was anything I could do to help Miss Ralston. I do a door cooking. Then I went upstairs to my bedroom. Why? Well, it is quite natural to go to one's bedroom, don't you think so? One does like to be alone sometimes. You went to your bedroom because you wanted to be alone. And I wanted to brush my hair and tidy up. You wanted to brush your hair? Anyways, that's where I was. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear Mrs. Ralston scream? Yes. And you came down here? Yes. Curious that you and Mr. Ralston met me on the stairs. I went up by the back stairs. They're near to my room. Did you enter your room through the back stairs? Yes, I entered my room through the back stairs too. Very well. Mr. Carabaccini. I have told you. I was playing the piano in the drawing room. Through that, Inspector. I'm not an inspector, just a sergeant. Did anyone hear you play the piano? I do not expect so. Let's play very, very softly, with one finger, like so. He must be every fine night. Is that true? Yes, it is a very catchy little tune. It is, how shall I say, a haunting little tune? Don't you all think so? I think it's horrible. And yet, it runs in people's heads. Why, someone was whistling it too. Whistling it where? I am not sure. Perhaps in the front hall, perhaps on the stairs, perhaps even upstairs in the bedroom. Who is whistling three blind mice? Are you making this up, Mr. Carpaccini? No, no, Inspector. I beg your pardon. Sergeant, I would not do a thing like that. Go on. You're playing the piano. With one finger, like so. And then I hear the radio playing very loud. <coughs> Someone was shouting on it, fed it by ears. And after that, I hear Mrs. Ralston scream. Mr. Ralston upstairs, Mr. Wren upstairs, her machine in the drawing room. Miss Casewell. I was writing letters in the library. Did you hear what was going on in here? No, I didn't hear anything until Miss Ralston screamed. And you came in here? Yes. At once? I think so. Minute. Curious there's no unfinished letter on the writing desk in the library. I brought them with me. <laughs> Dearest Jesse, a friend of yours or a relation. That is none of your damn business. I guess not. You know, if I heard someone scream blue murder, I don't think I'd take the time to fold my unfinished letter and put it in my handbag before coming to see what the matter was. You wouldn't. How interesting. Very well. Major Metcalf, you say you're in the cellars. Why? Looking around, looking around. I was just looking in the cupboard under the stairs. You know, the one near the kitchen. And I saw a bunch of drunken sports guy. But I saw a door in there too, so I opened it. There was a set of stairs. I went down them because I was curious. And very nice talents you've got, Miss Ralston. Glad you like them. Not at all. Crypt of an old monastery, I should say. Probably why this place is called Monk's Well. We're not engaged in anti queer research, Major Metcalf. We're investigating a murder. Now, Mrs. Ralston says she heard a door creak. That specific door shut with a creak. Give you know that after murdering Mrs. Boyle, the murderer heard Mrs. Ralston coming from the kitchen and slipped into the cupboard, pulling the door after him. A lot of things could be, Sergeant. There would be fingerprints on the inside of the cupboard. Well, matter there, sure. But aren't most criminals careful to wear gloves? Well, it's usual, but all criminals slip up sooner or later. <laughs> I wonder, Sergeant, if that's really true. Look here. I'm wasting time. Please, Please Mr. Ralston. I'm in charge of this investigation. Oh, very well. But, Mr. Ralston, thank you. Now, look, the unestablished opportunity, as well as motive. I want to tell you all this. You all had opportunity. No, I was supposed to see you. There are two staircases. And it would go down by one and come up through the other. 
and we could have gone down to the cellars by the door near the kitchen that lead to a flight of the steps, that lead to a trap door to the foot of the steps over there. The vital fact was you all were alone when the time the murder was committed. If you speak as though we were all under suspicion, that's absurd. In a murder case, everyone is under suspicion. But you know pretty well who killed that woman in Culver Street. You believe she's the eldest of those children, a mentally abnormal young man who would now be about 23 years of age. Well, damn it all, but I find that there's only one person here who fits the bill. It's not true! It's not true! You're all against me! You've always been against me! You're gonna say I committed these murders? It's persecution! That's what it is! It's persecution! Lydia, Lydia, it's okay. It's alright, Chris. Nobody is against you. Tell him it's alright! We don't frame people. How come you're not going to arrest him? I'm not gonna arrest anyone. Do that, I've got to have evidence, and I haven't got any evidence. Molly, yes. you're crazy. And you too. There's only one person who fits the bill, and if only as a safety precaution, he ought to be locked up. It's only fair to the rest of us. Hey, Giles, wait. <clears throat> Sergeant Trotter, can I speak to you a minute? Certainly, Mrs. Walston. Will the rest of you go into the dining room, please? I'm staying. No, Giles, you too, please. I'm staying. I don't know what's going over you, Molly. <clears throat> Now then, Mrs. Ralston, what does he want to say to me? Sergeant Trotter, you think that this crazy killer must be the eldest of those three boys at the farm. But you don't actually know that, do you? Well, we actually don't know a thing. All that so far is the woman who joined her husband in the ill-treating and starving of those kids <coughs> has been killed, and that the woman magistrate responsible for putting them there has also been killed. The telephone wire that leads me to the police headquarters has been cut. But you don't even know that. It may have just been the snow. No, Mrs. Ralston. The line was deliberately cut by the front door I found the place. <coughs> Take a seat, Mrs. Ralston. But all the same, you don't know. We're going by probability. It all points away, Mrs. Ralston. Mental instability, childish mentality, desertion from the army, and the psychiatrist reports. We know, and therefore it all seems to point to Christopher, but I don't believe it is Christopher. There must be other possibilities. Such as? Well... Had of those children any relations at all? The mother was a drunk. Uh, she died shortly after her kids were taken away from her. What about their father? Um, he was an army deserter, uh, serving abroad. If he's been deserted, I mean, if he's still alive, he's probably been deserted by now. You don't know where he is now? No. That would take information. We don't have any at the current moment. But I can assure you, Mrs. Ralston, the police take every eventuality into account. So, the murderer may be middle-aged or even old. When I said the police had rung up, Major Metcalf was frightfully upset. He really was. I saw his face. Major Metcalf? Middle-aged, a soldier. I know he seems quite nice and perfectly normal and everything, but it might not show, might it? No, often it doesn't show at all. So it's not only Christopher who's a suspect. There's Major Metcalf as well. Any other suggestions? Well, Mr. Parabuccini did drop the poker when I said the police had rung up. Mr. Parabuccini? I know he seems quite old and poor and everything, but he might really be as old as he looks. He moves like a much younger man, and he's definitely got makeup on his face. Miss Case will notice it too. He might be, I know it sounds very melodramatic, but he might be disguised. You're very anxious, aren't you? That shouldn't be young Mr. Wren. He seems so helpless. How? He's so unhappy. I'm going to show you, Mrs. Walston, had every possibility into mind. Ever since the beginning. The brother Georgie, the father, and someone else. There was a sister too, remember? The sister? Oh yes. It could have been a woman who killed Mrs. Lyme. You see, the man's felt hat was pulled down, the muffler was pulled up, the killer spoke in a whisper, remember? It's the voice that gives the sex away. Oh yes, it could have been a woman. Miss Casewell. And she looks a little bit too old for the parts. But I can show you, Mrs. Ralston, there's a wide field. There's you, for instance. Me? Yes, you're about the right age now. Whatever you want to tell me about yourself, I have no means of checking it up at the moment. Remember? And then there's your husband. Giles, how ridiculous. <laughs> he and Mr. Wren are much the same age. Suppose your husband looks older than he actually is, and Wren looks younger. Real age is very hard to tell. Just how much do you know about Giles Ralston? How much do I know about Giles? Don't be silly. You've been married how long? Just a year. You met him where? At a dance in London. We went to a party. Did you meet his people? He hasn't any people. They're all dead. 
They're all dead. Yes, but you make it sound all wrong. His father was a barrister and his mother died when he was a baby. You're only telling me what he told you. Yes. You don't have that of your own knowledge. It's outrageous. You'd be surprised, Mrs. Ralston, at just how many cases like yours we actually get, Oof, especially after the war. Homes broken, families dead. Man, so he's just been in the Air Force or completed Army training. Parents killed, no relation. There's just no backgrounds nowadays. Young people sell their own affairs. They meet and marry. You see, it was the parents and relatives who used to set the inquiries for the consent to engage. That's all done away with now. Girl just marries her man. Sometimes she doesn't find out for a year or two that he's an absconding bank clerk or an army deserter or something equally undesirable. So tell me, how long do you know Giles Ross before you married him? Just three weeks. So you don't know anything about him. That's not true. I know everything about him. I know exactly the sort of person he is. He's Giles. And it's absolutely absurd to suggest that he's some horrible, crazy homicidal maniac. Why? He wasn't even lunching yesterday when the murder took place. Where was he? Here? No, he went across sale. He went across the country to get some wire getting our chickens. Bring it back with him. No, it turned out to be the wrong kind. Hmm. Only 30 miles from London, aren't you? And you got an ABC train schedule. What is it? Only an hour by train? A little longer by car? I tell you, Giles wasn't in London. Just a minute, Mrs. Ralston. Is this your husband's coat? Yes. Association of Ideas. It was how being at school. What's your real name? We we needn't go into that now. I ran away while still doing my army service. It was also <coughs> beastly. I hated it all. I know. I'm just like the unknown murderer. You see, I told you I'm the only one the specification fitted. My mother. My mother. Yes, your mother. Everything would have been all right if she hadn't died. She would have looked after me, taken care of me. You can't go on being looked after by your wife, Christopher. Things happen to you, you've got to bear them. You've got to go on just as usual. One can't just do that. Yes, one can't. You mean, you have? Yes. What was it, something very bad? Something I've never forgotten. Was it to do with Giles? No. It was long before I met Giles. You must have been very young, almost a child. Perhaps that's why it was so awful. It was terrible, terrible. I try to put it out of my mind. I try never to think about it. So you're running away from things too, instead of facing them? Perhaps in a way I am. Considering that I never saw you until yesterday, we seem to know each other rather well. Yes, it's quite odd, isn't it? I don't know. I, I, I suppose there's a sort of sympathy between us. Anyways, you think I ought to stick it out? Well, frankly, what else can you do? I might pinch the sergeant's skis. I'm quite good at skiing. That would be frightfully stupid. It would be almost like admitting you're guilty. Well, Sergeant Trotter already thinks I'm guilty. No, he doesn't. At least, I don't know what he thinks. I hate him, I hate him, I hate him! Who? Sergeant Trotter! He puts things into your head 
things that aren't true, things that can't possibly be true. Molly, what is all this? You see this? What is it? Yesterday's evening paper, a London paper. And it was in Giles' overcoat pocket, but Giles didn't go to London yesterday. Well, if he was here all But day, he wasn't. He went across country to a cell to get some wire netting for our chickens. Well, maybe he went up to London. Then why shouldn't he tell me he did? Why pretend he did racing around the countryside? Well, maybe with all this news of the murder. He didn't know about the murder. Or did he? Did he? Good Lord, Molly, surely you don't think the sergeant doesn't think. I don't know what the sergeant thinks. And he can make you think things about people? You ask yourself questions and you begin to doubt? You feel that somebody you love and know well might be a stranger. That's what happens in a nightmare. You're somewhere along with friends and then you suddenly look at their faces and they're not your friends any longer. They're different people, just pretending. Perhaps you can't trust anybody. Perhaps everybody's a stranger. I seem to be interrupting something. No, we were, we were just talking. <laughs> I'll come help you in the kitchen. Yeah, I, I'm not No, you won't. Die. Please. Tell Tess I'm very healthy. Please at present. You will keep out of the kitchen and keep away from my wife. Okay, just wait a minute. You will keep away from my wife, friend. She is not going to be the next victim. <gasps> so that's what you become. I've already said so, haven't I? There's a killer loose in this house, and it seems to me only you fit the bill. Well, I'm not the only one who fit the bill. I don't see who else does. Are you blind? Or do you just pretend to be? I tell you, I'm worrying for my wife's safety. If I'm worrying for hers too, I am not leaving you alone with her. What the hell? Please go with her. I'm not leaving you with it. Please, Curtis, I need it. Fine. But I won't be far away. <laughs> Molly, you must be crazy. Curtis prepared to lock himself up in the kitchen with a homicidal mania. He isn't. You've only got to look at him to see he's barmy. He isn't, Giles. He isn't dangerous. I tell you, I know he was dangerous. And anyways, I can look after myself. That's what Mrs. Boyle said. Oh, Giles, don't! Look here, where did you first know him? What are you talking about? Perhaps you'd seen him before, met him in some place. Or perhaps, perhaps you suggested him to come here and you both didn't meet for the first time. All cooked up between you, was it? Giles, you are being absolutely ridiculous. How dare you suggest these things? Rather odd, isn't it? Didn't you come to stay at an out-of-the-way place like this? No odder than that, this case won't major my cat from Mrs. Boyle, should. I read once in the paper these homicidal maniacs could attract women. It looks as though that were true. How long has you know him? How long has this been going on? You are being absolutely ridiculous. I never said I went to Super Ryan and Billy to you until he arrived yesterday. That's what you say. Perhaps you've been running up to London to meet him on the slide. You know perfectly well that I've been up to London for weeks. You haven't been up to London for weeks. Is that so? I don't know what you mean. It's quite true. Is it? Then what's this? This is one of the gloves that was in your purse. Do you see what's inside? I... It's a London bus ticket. You <laughs> 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 only go to the village yesterday, but you went to London as well. Oh, right. I think so. Whilst I was safely racing about the countryside. Whilst you were racing around the countryside? Go on now, admit it. You went to London. Alright! I went to London. So did you. What? So did you. You brought back a new paper. Where did you get hold of that? It was in your overcoat pocket. Anybody could have put it there. Did they? No, you were in London. All right, yes, I was in London. I didn't go to meet a woman there. Didn't you? And what do you mean? Are you sure you didn't? Go away. Don't What do you me. matter? Don't touch me! <laughs> Look here, did you go to London in space meet Christopher Wren? Don't be a fool, of course I didn't. Then why did you go? I... I shan't tell you that. Perhaps I've forgotten why I went. Smalley, I don't know what's going over you. You're different all of a sudden. I feel like I don't know you anymore. Perhaps you never did know me. You spent how long? A year? You don't know what I thought or felt or suffered or done before you knew me? Molly, you're crazy. Alright, then I'm crazy. Why not? Perhaps it's fun to be crazy. What in the hell? No, no! I am sure of you young people are not for sake a little more than you need. What is so actually lover's quarrels? Oh, lover's quarrel. That's good. Quite so, quite so. I know just how you feel. 
I've been through all this myself when I was a younger man. Jure, jure, as the parrot says. Not been very long, I imagine. It's none of your business, parrot genie. No, no, no business at all. But I just came to say that the sergeant can't find his ease, and I'm afraid he is terribly annoyed. Christopher, what's that? He wants to know if you approve them by any chance, Mr. Ralston. Of course not. Mr. and Mrs. Ralston, did either of you two repair of skis from the cover we put them? Certainly not. Well, somebody's taken them. What made you happen to look for them? I need help reinforcing this and ski down to Market Hampton and report the situation. And now you can. Dear, dear. Somebody seemed to it that you certainly shan't do that. But there could be another reason, couldn't there? Yes, what? Somebody may want to get away. What did you mean when you said Christopher just now? Uh, nothing. <laughs> so a young architect has hooked it, has he? Very, very interesting. Christopher, he said he's going to be gone after all. Mr. Wren, did you move a pair of skis? Your ski, Sergeant? No. Why would I? Well, Mrs. Ralston seemed to think that. Mr. Wren is very fond of skiing. I thought he might have taken them just to get a little exercise. Exercise. Listen to you people. My only source of communication with the outside world has been taken from me. I want everyone to settle here at once. I think Miss Casewell has gone upstairs. I'll get her. I left Major Metcalf in the dining room. Major Metcalf. I'll try and He's find not him. there now. Hello? Won't take me? Especially my skis, sir. My skis? Mr. Ralston! Did either of you two repair peas that repair skis from the cover right now? <coughs> Gosh, no. Why should I? And I haven't got them. Nevertheless, they are gone. Which way did you get to your room from? Uh, the back stairs. Did you pass by the cover door? If you say so, I have no idea where your skis are. You were actually in that cover today. Yes, I was. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed. At the time Mrs. Boyle was killed, I was down in the cellar. Did you see my skis there? I haven't the least idea. I should sure remember. Can't remember. You might have just remember if my skis were there then. No good shutting up, young fellow. I don't think about anything damn skis. I was thinking about the cellar. <laughs> Architecture of this place is very interesting. I opened up the door and went down the stairs. But I can't tell you the skis were there or not. You realize that you yourself had a perfect opportunity of taking them? Yes, yes, I grant you that. If I wanted you that, yes. The question is, where are they now? We ought to be able to find them if we all set to. Not a case of hunt for the thimble. Whacking great things, skis. Suppose we all set to. Just a minute, Major Metcalf. That may what we're meant to do. I don't see what you mean. I have to put myself in the position of a crazy cunning brain. I have to ask myself what he's going to do and what he himself wants us to do. If we don't stay one step ahead of them, there will be another death. You still don't believe that? Yes, Miss Casewell, I do. Three blind mice, two already canceled out, one still yet to be dealt with. There are six of you here with me right now. One of you is a killer. Hmm? One of you is a killer. And one of you is a killer's prospective victim. That's who I'm talking to right now. See, this is Boyle held out. You, whoever you are, are holding out on me. Well, don't, because you're in danger, deadly danger. And nobody's killed twice is going to hesitate to kill a third time. And as it is, I don't know which one of you needs protection. Haunt anyone with any information no matter how slight? To prove themselves that by God's business, I better come out with it. All right. You won't. Have it your way. I'll catch the killer. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I have no doubt of that. But it may be too late for one of them. Let me tell you this. The killer is enjoying himself. Oh. He's enjoying himself great. Give me all this first. Have you ever tried chicken's liver served on toast that has been thickly smeared with foie gras? With a very thin rash of bacon just touched with a sousson of fresh mustard? I will come with you to the kitchen and we will see what we can get caught together. A charming occupation. I'm not with my wife there, Regina. Your husband is afraid for you. Quite natural under the circumstances. He doesn't fancy you being alone with me. It is my sadistic tendencies he fears, not my dishonorable ones. Alas, what an inconvenience the husband always is. Remember, Della, 
I am sure, Giles. He is very wise. Take no chances. I mean, can I prove to you, or to him, or to a dog sergeant, that I am not a homicidal maniac? So difficult to prove a name. And perhaps instead, I am really. Mm -hmm. Oh, But such a gay little tune, don't you think? She cut off the toes with a carving knife. Sneak, sneak, sneak. <laughs> Delicious. Just what a child would adore. Cruel little things, children. Some of them never grow up. <gasps> Stop frightening my wife for once. It's silly of me, but you see, I found her. Her face was all purple. Can't forget it. I know. It's difficult to forget things, is it not? I mean, you aren't really the forgetting kind. I, I must go. Do pie and potatoes all the reason? Please, Giles. What did you say to upset the poor lady, sir? Me, son? No, just a little innocent fun. I've always been fond of a little joke. You see, there's nice fun, and then there's fun that's not so nice. <laughs> now I wonder what you mean by that. You know, I've been doing a little worrying about you, sir. Indeed. Not that car of yours, how overturned in the snow just so conveniently. Inconveniently, you mean. Dirty exactly. I guess it depends on how you look at it. Say, were you bound for, by the way, when you had this accident? Oh, I was off to visit a friend. In the neighborhood? Not so very far from here. What's the name and address of this friend? No, really, Sergeant Trotter, does that matter now? I mean, it has nothing to do with the current predicament, has it? I always like the fullest information. Now, what do you say the name of the friend was again? I didn't say. That's right. You didn't say. It seems you're not going to say. Now, that is very interesting. But there may be so many reasons, and all more discretion. These jealous husbands. A bit too old to be running around with the ladies at your time of life, aren't you? My dear <laughs> son, I might not be perhaps quite so old as I look. No, that's what I was just thinking about. What? That you're not as old as you try to look. You see, many people try to look younger than their actual years, so when one tries to look older, it does make one question oneself more. Having asked questions of so many people, you ask questions of yourself as well. Isn't that overdoing things? I might get some answers from me, but I don't get many from you. Well, well, try again. That is, if you have any more questions to ask. Just one or two. Where were you coming from last night? That is simple. From London. What's your address? Uh, I always stay in the Ritz Hotel. What about your permanent address? I dislike permanency. Business or profession? I play the markets. Stockbroker? No, no, you misunderstand me. Enjoying this little game, aren't you? So sure of yourself, too. I wouldn't be so sure, Mr. Fervicini. You're mixed up in a murder case, and don't you forget about it. Murder isn't just fun and games. Not even this murder? <laughs> Dear me, Sergeant Trotter, you are very serious. I always have thought policemen have no sense of humor. Is the Inquisition over for the moment? <laughs> for the moment, yes. Thank you so much. Now I will go and search for his keys in the drawing room, just in case someone's hidden them in the grand piano. Are you speaking to me? Uh, yes, Miss Caswell. Uh, perhaps you take a seat. Well, what do you want? You may have heard some of the questions I was asking Mr. Perdicini. I heard them. Well, I'd like some information from you. What do you want to know? Full name, please. Leslie Margaret. Catherine Caswell. Catherine. I spell it with a K. Quite so, an address. Villa Mariposa Pine Dior Mallorca. That's Italy. It's an island. A Spanish island. Uh, well, what's your English address? Care of Morgan's Bank, Lenthal Street. No other English dresses? No. How long have you been staying in Only a week. And where have you been staying at since your arrival? At the Lesbury Hotel in Knightsbridge. And um, 
How long is it that you suppose to stay here in England? Until I finish what I came here to do. And, uh, well, what's that? What's that? Huh? What's you came here to do? I beg your pardon, I was thinking of something else. You didn't answer my question. You know, I don't see why I should. It's a matter that concerns me alone, a strictly private affair. All the same, Miss Casewell. No, I don't think we'll argue about it. Would you mind telling me your age? Not in the least. Due to some of my passports, I am 24. You're 24? You were thinking I looked older. That's quite true. Anyone in the country could vouch me. My bank can reassure you as to my financial position. I can also refer you to a solicitor. Very discreet man. I'm not in the position to offer you a social reference. I live most of my life abroad. In Mallorca? In Mallorca and other places. Were you born abroad? No, I left England when I was 13. You know, I, I, I can't quite make you out in this case well. Does it matter? I don't know. What was it you came here to do? It seems to worry you. It does worry me. You say you went abroad when you were 13? 12, 13, thereabouts. Was your name Casewell then? It's my name now. What was your name then? Come on, tell me. What are you trying to prove? I want to know what your name was when you left England. It's been a long time ago. Maybe I've forgotten. There are some things one doesn't possibly forget. Possibly. Unhappiness, despair. I dare say. What's your real name? I told you! Leslie Margaret Catherine Casewell! Ka Catherine? What the hell are you doing here? I always thought the police weren't allowed to give people the third degree. I was uh, simply um, interrogating Miss Casewell. You seem to upset her. What did you do? No, no, no. It's, it's nothing. It's just all this murder. It came over me suddenly. I, I'll just go to my room. What can you believe, Sergeant? Six impossible things happening before breakfast. Oh, just like the Red Queen. Uh, yes, it's um, it's rather like that. Dear me, you look as though you've seen the ghost. It, it, it's something I ought to have seen before. Uh, blind as a bat I have been, but uh, now I think I'll be able to get somewhere. So, the police have a clue. Yes, Mr. Wren. At last, the police finally have a clue. I want everyone here assembled. Uh, do you know where they are? Hmm. Giles and Molly are in the kitchen. I've been helping Major Metcalf look for your skis. We've looked in the most entertaining places. <laughs> but all to no avail. I don't know where Peravicini is. You go, uh, you go get the others up. I'll, I'll fetch them. Mr. Perpicini! Mr. Perpicini! Yes, sir. What can I do for you? That little bow policeman has gone lost his skis and doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone and go no come on. Dragging a murderer behind them. <laughs> What's all this? Sit down, Major. Uh, Mrs. Ralston. Must I come now? It's very inconvenient. There are more important things than cooking meals, Mrs. Ralston. Mrs. Boyle, for instance, will be having another meal. That is a very practical way of putting things, Sergeant. I'm sorry, sir. I want cooperation. I intend on getting it. Now then, Mr. Ralston, can you go upstairs and get Catherine? Miss Casewell for me, please? I'll tell her just to be a minute. Have your skis been found, Sergeant? No, Mrs. Ralston. My skis have not been found. I have a very true suspicion of who took them. Though why they are taken, I won't go into that at the further moment. Please don't! I always think explanations should be saved to the very end! That exciting last chapter, you know! This isn't a game, sir. Isn't it? Now there I think you're wrong. I think it is a game to somebody. You think the murderer is enjoying himself? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Down this case. Well, uh, Mrs. Ralston. Now, will you all pay attention, please? You may
may remember that for the murder of Mrs. Boyle, I took statements from each and every single one of you. Those statements related to your position at the time Mrs. Boyle was killed. The statements are as follows. Mrs. Ralston in the kitchen. Ms. Paravicini playing the piano in the drawing room. Ms. Casewell in the library writing letters. Mr. Ralston upstairs in his room. Mr. Ren Ditto. Major Metcalf in the cellars. Correct. Those are the statements you all gave me. Now, I have no means of checking if these statements are true. They may be true, they may not. But to put it quite clearly, five of these statements are true, and one of them is false. And I have a plan that will help me find out who's been lying. So if I know who's been lying to me, then I know who the killer is. Not necessarily. Someone may have lied for some other reason. I'd rather doubt it. Well, what's the idea? You just said you're known to check any statements. No, but suppose we go through them a second time. Oh, that old chestnut. A reconstruction of the crime. That's a foreign idea. <coughs> Not a reconstruction of the crime, Mr. Perpicini. Rather, a reconstruction of actions of seemingly innocent persons. And what do you expect to learn from that? You'll forgive me if I don't say why at the present moment. You want a reperformance? Yes, uh, the same actions we repeat. Then I will once again go into the drawing room, and with one finger, I shall I'll pick up the signature tune of a murderer. Tom, no. Not quite so fast, Mr. Perpicini. Mrs. Ralston, do you know how to play the piano? Yes. And do you know the tune of Three Blind Mice? Don't we all know it? So, if you could go into the piano room and play it for me when I give you the signal. But, my... Dear Sergeant, I understood that we were each to repeat our former roles. The former actions will be completed, yes. But not necessarily by the same people. I don't see the point. There is a point. It's me I'm checking up on the statements. <coughs> Maybe one statement in particular. Now then, I'm going to assign you all each new roles. Mr. Ren, since you're very fond of cooking, we'll go into the kitchen and look after Mrs. Walton's food for you. Uh, Mr. Paravicini, uh, we go to Mr. Ren's room. Uh, by the back stairs is the most convenient way. Uh, Major Metcalf, go to Mr. Ralston's room and try the extension telephone. Casewell, go to the cellars. Uh, Mr. Ren will show you the way. And unfortunately, I have to ask him to re-perform my actions. It's a rather chilly job, but you're probably one of the strongest people here, Mr. Ralston. Will you go ahead and do it? What are you going to do? The games! Oh, the games! Uh, no objection to my own no, but, but to answer your question, what I'll be doing is playing the role of Mrs. Boyd. Taking a bit of a risk, aren't you? We're all supposed to stay in our former spots, and I'll call you all when I'm ready. And sir, my torch is behind the curtain over there. I would recommend you take it. You need help? <laughs> no, sorry. These jackets, always so... <laughs> now that Mrs. Walston, count the tenants start to play the piano. Mrs. Ralston? Mrs. Ralston? Yes, what is it? You're looking very pleased with yourself, Sergeant. Have you got what you wanted? Oh, I got exactly what I wanted. You know who the murderer is? Yes. Which of them? You ought to know, Mrs. Ralston. I? Yes. You've been terribly foolish, you know. By holding out on me, you could have been killed. As a result, you put yourself in danger more than once. I don't know what you mean. Oh, come on, Mrs. Ralston. Us policemen aren't as foolish as you think we are. All along I knew you had first-hand knowledge in the Long Ridge Farm Affair. You knew Mrs. Boyle was a magistrate concerned. In fact, you knew all about it. So why don't you speak up and say so? I don't understand. I wanted to forget. Was your maiden name Waring? Yes. Miss Waring. You taught school. The school where those children went. Yes. Is it true that Jimmy, the child who died, posted you a letter? 
a letter to his kind young teacher asking for help. You never responded to that letter. I couldn't. I never got it. You just didn't bother. That's not true. I was ill. I went down with pneumonia that very day. The letter was put aside with a lot of others. It was weeks afterwards that I got it with a lot of other letters. And I said, child, Ed, Ted, waiting for me to do something, hoping, crashing, losing hope. Oh, it's haunted me ever since. If only I hadn't been ill. If only I'd known. It's monstrous that such things should happen. Oh, yes. It's rather monstrous. <laughs> Oh, I'm not a policeman, Mrs. Ralston. <gasps> you thought I was a policeman because I rang up from a call box saying that Sergeant Trotter was on his way. I got the telephone call to warn you to the front door. You know who I am, Mrs. Ralston. I'm Georgie. I'm Jimmy's brother, Georgie. <gasps> oh. Better not scream, Mrs. Ralston. I shall fire this gun. I'll let talk to you for a minute. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Jimmy died. That nasty, cruel woman killed him. They put her in prison. Prison? Prison wasn't bad enough for her. I said I'd kill her when she got out, and I did. In the fog, oh, it was great fun. <sighs> I hope Jimmy knows that I'll kill them all when I grow up. That's what I told my son. Because brothers can do whatever they want. I'm going to kill you in just a minute. You better not. You'll never get away safely, you know. Someone's hidden my skis. But you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't even matter at this point. I don't, I don't care if I get caught. I'm just, I'm so tired. But it, it's been great fun, to be fair, watching you all. I'm telling you to be a policeman. That gun will make a lot of noise. You're right. Yes, it, it will rather better do it the usual way and take you by the neck. Last little mouse in the no. top. No. I 
forgot all about your present. <laughs> It's a hat. Oh, a hat? But I, I practically never wear one. Just for best. It's lovely. Put it on. Uh, later, when my hair's done properly. <laughs> oh, it was alright, isn't it? The lady in the shop said it was the latest thing in hats. It's, it's lovely. Miss Ralston, it's <laughs> Ralston. <laughs> oh my god! 